Namaste. So, in the previous series, we've gone through the first two chapters, or actually Sanghitas, collections or compendiums, of the Shiva Purana. The Mahatma and the Vidyeshwara. So, these two Sanghitas first of all, give a general introduction to Shiva Purana in the Mahatmyam. And in the Vidyeshwara Samhita, we learn about all the different methods of worshipping Shiva. And there are so many, from individual, personal, very simple worship, all the way up to extremely elaborate temple rituals requiring a whole staff of Brahmana priests. So, in all of them, there's one thing in common. That is to please Shiva. As you do to Shiva, Shiva does unto you. This is such a very simple notion, but it's at the root of the whole Shiva Purana and the understanding of bhakti, devotional service and devotional love. Now, when you're in a relationship with somebody, it's natural to serve them. In fact, my Adi Guru used to always say, service is the essence of love. If you really love someone, you serve them. You try to understand what they like and what they don't like, and then you do what they like. Huh? It's such a simple thing. But people are so deluded by ego that they want to do what they like and then somehow brand it as devotional service. But, you know, Shiva accepts even that. He, he knows what's going on. <laughs> He's so insightful and we are so transparent because he is in everything and everywhere. He knows. That's because Shiva is identical with Nirguna Brahman. So, the next Sanghita is the Rudra Sanghita. And in many descriptions of Shiva Purana, including within the Purana itself, at the end, this is described as the most important, most powerful uh, section of the work and the most essential. It gives the greatest benefits. So what is so great about this Rudra Sanghita? Well, if you love someone, like I said, you want to know what they like, what they don't like. You want to know how they operate, what their purpose is, and their style in general, so that you can cooperate with them in a way that furthers their purposes. See, this is love. Not that I'm trying to exploit someone or get whatever I can from them. Uh, you know, that's just selfishness. That's childish, two-year-old stuff. But a mature person has a strong desire to love. And that means finding out what's really desired by that person that they love and to give that to them. So, Rudra Sanghita discusses Shiva's character, Shiva's style, Shiva's way of doing things, his manner of relating with his devotees and others. <laughs> and he shows he displays a type of personality that I would call 
a sincere trickster. He's a joker. He loves to put people on. <laughs> but he does it in such a way that they learn and benefit from it. We'll see in the very first story in the second chapter of Rudra Sanghita how he plays with Narada and reduces his uh, self-importance and arrogance. Uh, so this is the first lesson that we have to learn in dealing with Shiva. We have to be humble. After all, what are we in comparison with him? You know, really infinitesimal. Just, you know, a dot. <laughs> a nothing. But to him, we're important. Why? Because he's the father of the universe. Just like Shakti is the mother of the universe. And, you know, just like an ordinary father and mother, because they are the archetypes of fathers and mothers everywhere. The mother is very indulgent and tolerant, very permissive and soft. And the father is the disciplinarian. The father has certain standards that he expects us to meet and follow. And if we don't follow, he punishes us for our own good. Huh? This hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> but really, that's the way Shiva is. <laughs> And Shiva is also Ashutosh. He is easily pleased, but he's also easily displeased. His reactions are immediate. Uh, unlike Vishnu or Brahma or even Ganapati, he gives immediate results to the worshiper. I'll tell you one story in that regard. When I first got my Shiva Lingam, my Svatik crystal Lingam, uh, I was studying how to worship, and I was going to different temples, watching and even participating in the worship, daily worship of the Shiva Lingam. And, uh, but I, I wasn't doing anything with my Shiva Lingam because like, I didn't want to do anything wrong, <laughs> you know. So after several weeks of uh, study, I decided, well, I'm going to try a little something because I'm trying to come up with a way of worshiping Shiva Lingam that is accessible to everybody, even Westerners and like that. So I set things up, you know, the paraphernalia, and I, I made a ghee lamp with the uh, ghee and scented oil and a cotton wick, you know, in a bowl. And then I lit it, and I offered it very simply, not with any elaborate mantra, but just saying, idang deepang, and the mula mantra for my deity. And I got such a rush of bliss. I mean, the most potent, concentrated bliss I've ever experienced. And, you know, if you follow this channel for any length of time, <laughs> that I have quite a bit of experience with bliss. But, I mean, this was too much. I had to actually <laughs> stop the worship and go lay down <laughs> because it was overwhelming. It was so powerful and it was completely internal. And it's not like I was asking for it or praying for it or trying to achieve it in any way. I was just practicing, you know, <laughs> but boom, Shiva's presence came into that lingam so strongly and so powerfully in just a second after I lit that lamp and offered it that I was just bowled over, you know, uh, happily bowled over. <laughs> but this is Shiva. This is his way. This is his style. Uh, he's not, you know, like Vishnu, like, you know, sitting on a high throne and saying, okay, now, uh, let's see, how are you going to surrender to me? You know, waiting uh, before he offers any response. No. Shiva is immediate. 
You take one step toward him, he takes a hundred steps toward you. And, of course, he has all power and all intelligence and everything at his disposal. So his response to our worship is maybe not exactly what we ask for, but it's always good for us in that it diminishes our false ego. It diminishes our pride and arrogance. A good example is Banasura. Banasura received some big blessings from Shiva. He got a hundred arms and he got, I don't know how many heads or whatever, and so many benedictions that he wouldn't be killed, he would be victorious and so on. But he became puffed up. Same with Ravana. Ravana got so many benedictions from Shiva, he became puffed up. And so what happened to both of them is that they, due to their pride, they got into battles that ruined them. Banasura was more fortunate than Ravana. He didn't get killed. Uh, but even Ravana got killed by Rama, so he attained liberation. But Banasura was, in a way, even more fortunate <laughs> because his, all his arms got cut off and all his extra heads, and he only had one left. And that, with, with that one head, he bowed to Shiva, surrendered, and was saved. And he became one of the Gana, one of the associates of Shiva. So this is the way Shiva operates. He always responds in such a way as to diminish our false pride. And if we think that we're special or that we can get away with stuff uh, by the benedictions of Shiva, well, we have a lesson coming. So this is all borne out in the stories, the pastimes, the leelas uh, that appear in the Rudra Sanghita. And Rudra Sanghita has three parts, creation, maintenance, and dissolution. So the first part is the Shrishti Kanda. Shrishti means creation. So these stories generally cluster around the theme of creation, which is very appropriate because we've also been studying in parallel the Mandukya Upanishad. Mandukya Upanishad deals with the illusory nature of the creation. So Shiva creates the universe through his maya. And his maya is so strong that even though the whole universe is just a dream, it appears as reality, even to great demigods, even to realized devotees. So... Our position is we have to use our intelligence to understand how Shiva is operating, what his character is, what his moods are, what his motivations and his purposes are. And of course, <laughs> this is very deep, very subtle, not for the stupid, but for the intelligent devotee with lots and lots of pious credits. This is why the worship given in the Vidyeshwara Sanghita is necessary before we can understand Shiva's character. And on the other hand, the description of his character is necessary for us to know who we are worshiping. Who are we praying to? What does this mantra mean when we say Nama Shivaya? So, this scripture is very intelligently constructed and the result of studying it and hearing it and following its instructions is that one gets Sayuja Mukti. One merges with Shiva and becomes completely free from all suffering. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>